Is that? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like I said, um, and for the recording, I'm Josiah Livens. Um, so, so yeah, so I wanted to go and actually hopefully do a crash course on mostly what is out there in deep learning, what you can use it for, and how you would get started. Um, and hopefully, like, there's two different routes that I think that you could go. You can go the deep, low-level math route, and then you can go the more high level, there's a lot more easier framework. So if you don't have a very solid ba math background, you can still like go full out and do really, really crazy stuff with this stuff. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully that's the general sense that you that you get. And um, I'll do a lot of links and a lot of tutorials that, uh, uh, or a link to a lot of tutorials they can look at. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what is deep learning, some of the tools that are used for it right now, and then some examples. Uh, there are also a lot of applications for these, um, so I'll go through a few of those. Okay, so deep learning, it is a subset of machine learning, and that is a subset of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence has been, been around for a very long time, and odds are if you've done anything computer science-based, you've either, either worked with something with artificial intelligence or you've actually done some simple written some simple programs that do some form of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, to me, I mean, artificial intelligence could be just a lot of if statements. So if this happens, do this, otherwise do that. Um, so it could be that, or you're doing this really crazy deep level deep learning stuff with neural nets and all that. All, everything in between that is artificial intelligence. You're, you're trying to get a computer to do something somewhat smart. Let's see. Yeah, so it, it was really hard for me to think about the difference between like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, mostly with artificial intelligence, it involves searching for a solution or doing some kind of like brute force game playing. Like if you're playing chess, it might just go and like find the best number of moves that go and like will allow it to get into some kind of winning state or something like that. Um, for me, artificial intelligence is just doing lots of searches. So whether you're doing a database search and you're going and trying to find the element the fastest way possible or the most intelligent way possible, that, that's probably the most immediate thing that comes to mind when we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, let me see. More specifically, machine learning so machine learning is really exciting. Um, odds are that if you all have emails, um, an easy example is right now Google and a lot of these companies, they have spam filters and how do they go and figure out what, what is spam and what isn't spam. So your, your two alternatives is that if you're a software engineer, if you're doing artificial intelligence approach, you're gonna design some super complicated algorithm that's going to look for like free, or you're going to measure how many like fancy graphics are in the email, or if it if the email is saying urgent or is from like some kind of URL. Um, artificial intelligence, you might go and hard code all of that, and then in a month you're going to have to throw that all away and recode it because all the uh, people sending spam emails have now changed what their spam emails look like. And you're gonna do that constantly over and over and over again, um, which is kind of ridiculous. So it would be better for the computer just to figure out what is spam so you don't have to do any of that coding. So machine learning goes and figures that out. It'll go and figure out whether this email might be spam or this email, and it might look at a giant group of emails, and if they're spam, it might try to, try to find commonalities between them. Um, see. Yeah, so machine learning is mostly involved in uh, finding patterns in large amount of data, clustering data, um, and then trying to make some kind of inference, so some kind of like classification or something like that. Um, finally, deep learning is very recent. Um, deep learning involves, involves neural nets. They're usually very, very deep. They're supposed to go and simulate the brain, so the more layers you have, the more complex representations you can actually 
see. And I'll go into a little more detail with that. Yeah, so this is just some some of the differences between them. Also, machine learning is doing like probability and also reinforcement learning and stuff like that. Um, so, so yeah, so you have everything from clustering. So um, k-means clustering, you might have a lot of data points and the goal is that you're gonna go and try to find what things belong to one group automatically. Uh, um, Probabilistic, like Bayesian inference, is going to be looking at what is the what is the probability that maybe a cause and effect happened or something like that. And um, SVMs are a very smart way. They go and use some data. They they keep some of the data to go and do some kind of like binary binary classification. So differentiating between like a dog or a cat. So SVMs will go and do something like that. Um, yeah. Um, support vector machines. Support vector machines, if you want to go and Google that. Um, they're very, very cool. Um, so from what I've seen, they do, they do binary. They'll go and split things in half. But there's a lot of tricks that you can do where you might stack SVMs. So you can actually do a lot of different classifications. Yeah? Um, did you start out by saying that SVMs is a subset of artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and the general goal is, so the, one of the, to me the biggest difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence is that machine learning is trying to go and use existing data to go and um, uh, accomplish something that you would otherwise have to really manually, like I'm talking about like if statements or you're doing some kind of like search trees or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so the goal of machine learning is that you don't have to do as much coding. Um, in fact, uh, the biggest goal is that you build your data set and you don't train, change your program. Um, and, and deep learning takes that to the extreme. So at some point, you only have your model, you don't change it for a year, you're just changing the data set. Um, so, so yeah. Um, symbolic algorithms, these seem, I feel like they, they, they're probably the more most intuitive ones. Um, they're taking in some kind of like logical relationships, like if you're talking about like uh, grandparents and relationships between them and children or something like that. Um, reinforcement learning, so this is what I'm actually studying right now. Um, you go and teach a algorithm to do something with just reward and punishment. So something here, if it goes and fails, like if the pull tips over, okay, it gets punished. But then the longer it keeps the pull up, the more reward it gets. Um, and so it just learns that automatically. Okay, and then we're at deep learning and neural nets. So something is deep learning if you're having multiple layers, um, and that allows you to do like a lot more complex representations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did I have? Okay, I have, um, yeah, you're talking about genetic algorithms? Yeah. So, so not really, but they're very closely tied. Like, th like, you can keep them separate, but yeah, they're, they're actually pretty closely tied. Um, uh, genetic algorithms are used for a lot more than just that. Uh, I was kind of, I wasn't really sure whether to put, put genetic algorithms in machine learning, but genetic algorithms is, a form of searching either for a solution or something like that. That involves uh, uh, splitting children up into, uh, or taking parents, making children, but randomly mutating the children, and then doing random combinations of them. Um, to me, it was a form of searching, so, so yeah. But they're definitely, they're definitely like com combined a lot. Um, yeah, so neural nets, so it's not, there's no such thing as like a single neural net or a single type of neural net. Uh, there's a lot of ways they can go and take these neurons and like stack them together. Um, once again, the main thing is that these are supposed to go and model how the brain works. Uh, let me see. Yeah. 
So the orange is the hidden layers, and then the green is your input, and then you have your output layers. So th the picture that I have here is an example of a fully connected one. So in the input layer, each of those neurons, each, each of those circles is connected to all of the neurons in the next one. And so all of the, each one of those lines is some kind of toggle or some kind of parameter between them. Um, and that can be inefficient. So one of, you, one of the people's goals is that you're going to reduce the number of those black lines that you have in the neural net um, so that your actual like, um, uh, back propagation works properly. Um, and I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk more in detail uh, later. But there's a lot of different implementations. That is a linear, fully connected neural net. And you could have either three of these, or you could have 50 of them, just all stacked in a giant line. Um, but then there's also convolutional RNN scans. And I have examples for these, like practical examples. Uh, at the bottom, DQNs, DT, DDPG, um, actor critic, um, those are reinforcement neural nets. So they are the neural nets that you use for like teaching, like um, uh, uh, at combining actions and correlating them with rewards and punishments. Um, and we'll go through a bunch of examples of those. Yeah, so yeah, that's the general idea. So it's supposed to be modeled off of this. So I think, and I don't know if someone, someone wants to correct me. Um, so dendrites are the inputs, and then when those inputs get high enough, like combined together and get high enough, a neuron will go and decide to actually fire, and then it'll actually fire it, signal out the, uh, the I think it's photons? I don't know how you say it, but, but yeah. It's collecting a bunch of inputs, and when they reach a threshold, it fires. And then what you do is you have hundreds of these correlated together in multiple layers. And what that actually allows you to do, this is a single one of these is very simple, but if you have a lot of these, they can do amazingly complicated um, actions or find very complicated patterns. And so this is the exact same thing as the biological picture that I showed, but in more of a mathematical term. Um, so each of these X's, they could be anything. Um, the easiest example would be like image pixels. So if you have a bunch of image pixels and then they're multiplied by some weights, um, uh, I'm wondering how I can explain that better. Um, yeah, so the X's are, could be like image pixels or something. So you're gonna go and try to predict whether maybe a picture of a dog or a cat. Uh, the weights are how important that pixel or that value is to that neuron. So, so that neuron, like maybe the outer, outer weights might be lower, but then the middle ones might be higher. Who knows? Um, and actually, you won't really have a whole lot of control over what those weights are, but that's the main challenge for neural nets in general. So when you're doing um, something called back propagation, it's going to go and toggle those weights until your neural net actually improves in whatever performance or accuracy that's doing. Um, and then, so it sums them together and does some kind of activation. The activation function decides, based on all these inputs, we've clumped all these together, when do I decide to actually fire off some kind of signal? Um, so, so, that's, so, so we have that there, but we'll also go into that more detail actually like when we're actually implementing this. Um, it's also really complicated, like, I can't show my speaker notes on here, so I'm using my phone actually right now. So, makes it kind of hard. Yeah, so this is just general summary. So a neuron has inputs, weights, and some kind of activation. Back propagation is the main, main problem with neural nets that people are trying to solve or make better. So, there's a lot of strategies with this um, uh, that's going to go and toggle them to go and improve some kind of accuracy. Um, terminology, when you see something like model parameters, those are the weights. Uh, loss is just how much the neural net needs to change its weights. It also says how wrong the model is. Um, 
Normalization, so when you're going and feeding your data into it, into a neural net, you have to make sure that there's zero to, to one. And uh, the hidden layers are the ones that aren't connected to your outputs or your inputs. Um, yeah, and we'll go into more detail with that. So, so one of the quickest things that you can do is uh, if you go to Playground TensorFlow, you can actually look at a neural net in action, and you can actually toggle the neurons. Um, right now it's doing a binary classification, like it's trying to classify, uh, classify the, the blue dots with the orange dots. Um, and so you can go and change, change how many layers you have, how big the layers are. Uh, and normally the more layers you have, the more complicated features you can have. So like something like this, if you add more layers and maybe like more neurons then It'll separate them. Um, yeah. Okay, so we talked about all that, but right now it's kind of high level. It's, it's kind of, maybe you don't really, maybe you don't have a really solid under, understanding of what's actually happening, so then we'll go into the actual tools and the actual code for this. Um, okay, uh, so I wanna go on Really quickly, Gage. Okay, so first off, like, who all is familiar with just machine learning in general? Okay, so not very many. Um, who all has worked with Python? Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so so if you're already familiar with Python, then this should be pretty uh, pretty obvious to you on how amazing it is. I, like, I, I've I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, so in recent years, it's gained in a lot of popularity, and mostly because of the libraries that are available to it. Um, uh, one of the package managers that I use is Anaconda. Um, I also use a more stripped down version of uh, Miniconda, because I like to install the packages that I, only the packages that I want. Uh, but Anaconda will go and just, if you download it, it'll just have everything for you. So you don't have to download anything new, um, in theory. Uh, some of the basic libraries, so there's this library called NumPy, and so if you've done any program, programming before, you know about arrays and 2D arrays. So NumPy is basically the same thing, except it does, it lets you do very, very complicated operations on them, uh, which is necessary for uh, just me reinforcement learning in general. Uh, pandas, okay, so pandas, you don't, you don't even need to do it for machine learning. So pandas, you can have literally an entire CSV as a variable, and, like you can take a CSV, shove it into a variable, and do operations on it in memory. Um, so so I, I usually try to think about like whether I need to use Excel or Google Sheets versus using pandas. Uh, so this is an example of actually reading in what is called a data frame. And so the data frame has all your columns, all the, sh all the, uh, all the values in each column. Um, so this is extremely useful in machine learning, but also in data science in general. Okay, so these are some really, really uh, popular data science libraries that are available. Um, TensorFlow is currently uh, uh, developed by Google. Uh, PyTorch is developed by Facebook. Then FastAI is built on top of PyTorch, but FastAI's goal is if you don't have a background in math, you should be able to do FastAI and actually toss up some very complicated models um, uh, uh, without having to have really detailed knowledge of, uh, of math or like matrix operations. But TensorFlow and PyTorch, they're a little bit more middle, low-level libraries, um, which I work a lot with PyTorch. Uh, I started off with TensorFlow, but I had a hard time with it. Its documentation is really challenging. Um, there's some other big differences also. Uh, so, so some common features of these frameworks. So they're all using something called a tensor. And all that a tensor is is just a 2D matrix that's a rectangle. Um, I stripped this, this off of TensorFlow's website describing what a tensor is. Um, I, don't, I don't really, that doesn't really help me definition-wise. Um, so 
just a better definition of what a tensor is, is just, a tensor is just a matrix that is rectangular. So at least in machine learning, that's what it is. So if you go and tell like a physicist or someone who has a physics background or an engineering background, they might harshly disagree with you on what a tensor is. But in machine learning, it's just a array that is, rec that is rectangular or, or cubic or something like that. Um, so you can see here, so all the way at the bottom, both at the bottom and also the middle NumPy array. So those are what you call, like in just computer science, just ragged arrays. They're just like, e like row zero might be just two, row three might be five, row four might be just uh, uh, 18, like size 18. Um, so if you, if you have an array that has inside it different lists of different lengths, it just becomes a ragged array and you can't do, basically if you have a ragged array, you can't do basic matrix operations on it then. Um, so they usually have to be, they have to be rectangular or cubic or whatever up in dimension that they are. Um, so, so that's all that a tensor is. So when you see a tensor, that's, it took me about, it took me about eight months to, to realize what it was and just ignored it. Um, so, so yeah. And also with these libraries like, uh, like PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, at the bottom is PyTorch. Um, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch tensors, they actually look a lot like NumPy arrays or like just regular lists. And they usually have similar functions. Uh, the biggest difference between tensors and NumPy arrays is that these frameworks will go and automatically actually um, decide whether or not this operation should be executed on a GPU or a CPU. And then also what order to go and execute those, those operations. So a lot of this is being automated. Um, in fact, like a lot of PyTorch and TensorFlow, one of the biggest powers for them is uh, uh, they, they'll automatically figure out what, what operations can be executed at the same time, so you don't have to think about that at all. Um, yeah, so that's an example of like the actual, an actual graph. So this is a very, very complicated model that's being visualized, um, but but this allows TensorFlow, so this is an example of a TensorFlow model. Uh, TensorFlow can automatically decide which one of those can be executed at the same time, distribu distributed across which GPUs at the same time, and can even uh, uh, be escalated up to entire clusters. So you can just distribute it across large numbers of different machines and it'll just figure it out on its own. Um, so that's like, when, when I think about PyTorch and TensorFlow, they, they really talk about their deep learning libraries, but they're really parallelization uh, libraries. They're really just deciding on what, what order to go and do these operations. And the reason why this is important is because some of these models can take weeks actually to train. So if you have, um, if you have something like someone like Google or Facebook trying to train on faces or something like that, uh, they need to be able to go and utilize their computing resources the best that they can. And so doing something like this makes it super easy. And uh, they made this open source so all of us can go and leverage this. Okay, so I have some examples of some Jupyter notebooks. Um, we'll see how far we get with them. I'm probably only gonna do the first one. Um, I'm gonna probably only do the image ML. This one's, only, this one's partially done, I don't really I don't have time to finish that one, but this one just shows uh, it can go and learn a sine wave. So, um, just switch over to that. Uh, this is the image one, right? Okay. Okay, so there's this website called Kaggle. So if you're in data science at all, um, you would know that Kaggle has a lot of data science, but if you're just getting into it, um, I would definitely go to Kaggle Look at, they have huge numbers of data sets. There's one data set that had, um, that had data collected from Catan games um, on like what, like who won or lost. And so you can train a machine learning model to go and predict what is the, what is the best move or something like that if you want to. Um, kind of crazy. Um, but you can get everything from stocks to image data sets, all of that stuff. Uh, what we're gonna get is something called an MNIST data set. Um, I don't remember why it's called MNIST. I don't know what it stands for. It's, a, it's an image data set that has a lot of pictures of numbers. And so your goal is to go and train your neural net to actually 
recognize and classify numbers. So I kind of walked through how to strip them out, um, but you're going to go put them into CS these CSVs. Um, and yeah, and so then we go and put them into a data frame. Um, so the journal label looks like this. So the first the first column in the data frame is labeled five, and that has all the actual like Y labels for your whether that picture is a four or a five or six or a seven. Um, all the other columns are the pixels. Um, it's kind of complicated, but I'm, I'll probably just breeze through this. Um, and this also, so I use I use a PyCharm IDE, and what it lets you do is you can actually go and peek into a data frame. And so this is actually what it looks like. So these are your, so yeah, so it's just, it's PyCharm. I think they have a community, they have a community IDE. Um, but so this is so this column is uh, labeled five. These are the actual labels. So like uh, row one has a picture of a four, and it's kind of ugly um, because we don't see a picture here. We just see a bunch of zeros. Um, but actually, if you go and rearrange them, if you go and follow all that, uh, where do I where do I have it? I thought that I showed it. Okay, so we do it there. So you have to go and wrap the pixels around. Um, so each row is, has 785 columns. Um, we go up here. So there are 785 columns of these going all the way to the right. Um, the first column is five. So the rest of the columns are just just talking about image pixels. And, and so like the image pixels, there are 784 image pixels and you can go and reshape them 28 by 28 and you actually get whatever the image looks like. So in this data set, the leftmost column has the, has the actual label and then everything, and then for each row, everything after it is just a flat image. And so your goal, so if you wanna go and actually see what that image looks like, you just call uh, the reshape the reshape method, and as long as you know what the original image's shape is, you shouldn't have any issues. Uh, 784 can be wrapped into a 28 by 28 image, and that's why we're able to see this. Um, yeah, what I'm a little bit mixed about this because the reshape method and stuff like that was kind of mind blowing. Um, so if you don't get it. Right now, that's completely fine. That took me a while to figure out. Um, yeah, it was pretty mind blowing to me, but um, hopefully, I mean, you can go and you can go and look at this on on my GitHub if you're confused by something. Definitely do an issue or a PR. Um, but so we have that. Um, but we're gonna just be feed, we're just gonna feed in a flat image. So if you have your own custom data set um, and you're just doing a regular linear neural net, just make the image really really flat. Just Flatten out all the pixels. Uh, NumPy makes this easy. You just call NumPy the NumPy array dot flatten, and it'll just flatten the image all the way out. Yeah. So I talk about more of that. Okay. So this. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. So if you have a pic, uh, picture, yeah. you're just gonna take the first row, shove it that way, so the next row, shove it that way, and just flatten them out. So it's literally flattened. And NumPy makes this easy, so you don't have to manually do that. You just call uh, dot flatten and it'll just flatten them out. And then you could just do reshape and wherever the, the image's original dimensions were, it'll just reshape them back. It's kind of mind blowing. It's, it's like, it took me a while to get comfortable with it. Um, and there's actually a lot of different ways they could just flatten images and reshape them. Um, so, so if you go and make them flat, then what you're doing then is similar to if you just had a regular CSV. Um, so if you had a CSV of like, uh, like if you wanted, if you if you had a CSV filled with, 
uh, student study hours and the number of hours that they slept, and you're trying to predict their average grade point average or something like that, um, then instead of 784, you would just be feeding in two. You'd be feeding in two features, which is their, the number of hours they studied and the number of hours that they slept. And then your label is just what their grade point average is. So yeah, so we go and load all that. Uh, I think I do, I do 200. Um, okay, yeah. So this is what our, our neural net looks like. Um, so the x dot shape, so right now we're pulling in, we're pulling in 200 rows. Um, we're gonna go and pretend that we only pulled in five just so this makes sense. Um, so if you go, go and pull in five, then x's shape is gonna be five and 784. Meaning you have five rows and then in each row there are 784 pixels. So we have only, f we have five images and then y shape, oh yeah, I, I blew past this. Um, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll go and, okay, so we have, pic we have now for each row, we have a bunch of pixels. Um, but our y is going to be some kind of label. So it's going to be somewhere, it's going to be either a one, a zero, a one, a two, all the way up to a nine. Um, now, neural nets need to have their data as from a scale of zero to one. And so you have two alternatives to uh, normalize your data. Pixels are really easy to normalize. All of them are always on a scale of zero to 255, um, which I do, do I do? Yeah, I do down here. So like X is just a list of pic images and you just divide them by 255 and now they're a scale of zero to one. So images are very easy to do that. Um, regular tabular data is a lot harder. But for labels, you have to do something called one hotting. So I don't know how to explain this, but Uh, I'll try my best. Huh. Oh, I can try my best. So, so why is has is going to be one of ten labels? It's going to be zero to nine. So we have ten classes that we want to go and predict. So we're gonna go and make some kind of array that is 10 classes wide. This should be five. Actually, I'll go and just, yeah, we'll just run that. Um, yeah, so it's five, cool. So Y is gonna have, so we have five pictures, and then Y is gonna have, be either one of 10 classes. And one hotting just means that we're gonna put ones wherever Y is. Um, so this is also kind of complicated. Um, so we translated Y from just being like full numbers to just zeros or ones. So you're just making it binary. Uh, so for example, if, Actually, the first row of Y, so the first, the first picture is actually a picture of a zero. So you're gonna put a one in index zero. And then picture two, that's a picture of a, I think that was a picture of a four. Yeah. Row two is a picture of a four. So you're gonna put a number at index four. And then row three is a picture of a one. So you're gonna put a one at index one. Um, so this is just a strategy to make your data uh, in a range from zero to one. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's uh, that's one of 
that's one of a few ways to go and actually normalize your data. And it's pretty common for actual like class-based image classification. So um, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah, yeah. So we've we're we're still we're still doing basically we're 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 taking our data and cleaning it before even feeding it into a model. So we haven't done any any deep learning yet. Yeah, yeah. So we're 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 preparing this for our model. And we're preparing to do Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. So you can't just feed, if you feed in the, okay, what if one of these numbers was a picture of 10 billion, right? You don't want to feed the literal value of 10 billion into your neural net. It will just throw it completely off. Um, so if you normalize them from zero to one, it keeps it really, really nice. Um, it, it trains a lot better. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. Like if you're going and actually training your own, own model and you're wondering why it's not working, I would go and check whether they're normalized or not. Because um, if they're not, you're going to have very, very weird results. Like it might work sometimes, and then sometimes it won't. It'll be really, really weird. So your goal, both your x and your y, uh, the data you're feeding in and the data you're comparing against, they all need to be 0 to 1. Um, so this is one strategy that you can use to make y from 0 to 1. And this is really common. Uh, this is something weird. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh. Whoops. Um. Oh, I could feed in. I could feed in more. Like you could feed in like twenty or thirty. I think originally I was just doing a. Uh, I was doing five just because it's easier for you to see. Because if you do two hundred, like two hundred different images of numbers. Um, then it's just going to be a massive cluster that you're not going to be able to read. So, yeah. Like these are. Yeah, and I'll. I probably should actually just jump to that just so it's a, a little bit easier. I'm going to just go ahead and run run this all again, um, just so you can see. Like, yeah, I probably should probably just show. Okay, so like this was this was this is an example of what they all look like. So you have so you might have two hundred images, but they're two hundred images of no, different numbers and how they're written from uh, zero to nine. So this is what the data set looks like. Um, so like this is what our model actually is predicting what they are. It is pretty good here, but then. Further down, these are images that hasn't seen before. It still does an okay job. Um, it should get one of these wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like for example, it gets this one wrong. So apparently that's actually an eight, um, but it thinks that it's a three. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So like that's one of the uh, that's one of those things where it, it it got it wrong, but it's also like even as a human, it's kind of confusing. So it kind of makes sense why I would get it wrong. Um, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, so one thing that we could do with this is we could do everything from image augmentation. We can make our model a little bit deeper. Um, we could also give it more examples. There are 60,000 pictures in this data set, so you could feed in all. You can feed in 60,000 of them, um, but I don't want to wait too long, so that's going to be on your own time. Um, also, the other issue is that we're so yeah. So we have that, and what our model actually looks like. Like this is what our model looks like. So that's our neural net. Um, it's 
pretty straightforward. If you're going to do 60,000, you'll realize that you'll run into an issue. It works on small data sets, but when you get into much larger ones and much more complicated representations, um, it'll just go kind of slow. Um, I might go and actually try it on all 60,000, though. Um, so, so for example, so originally we were doing five pictures, right? So five pictures, they could be any of the numbers, zero to nine, one of those. So uh, shape index one, this is, it's, it's basically putting in um, 784. So you put 784 here, that, that is our input size, and then this is our hidden layer size. Um, so 128 and then outputting uh, 16. So, so I think that this one has 128 neurons. Yeah, yeah. This one has 128 neurons and this one has 16 neurons and then you're getting some kind of output. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So when you make it flat, like, uh, tw uh, so that translates to 28 by 28. Yeah. So like what I showed earlier, yeah. So when you reshape it, yeah. When you do that reshape, 28 by 28, uh, that's what it's 784. Which means if the, if you made this 785 you're not going to be able to, it'll crash, it, like if you try doing reshape, it'll crash. Because it can't, it can't contort that. Um, part of the, part of the mind blowing thing about the reshape method is kind of, it was really confusing for me. Um, so. So is that telemetry like a, that is for you, like one unit? Um, you so have to. Oh. Oh, the actual size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the other confusing thing with linear layers. It does not care if like you have a pixel if you have if you have a bunch of pixels and like that are close to each other, like uh uh let's, what's a good example? So like a four. So if you have like a pixels on the left here that are lit up, a linear layer is not smart enough to care about pixels that are close to each other. Like, yeah, it does not care. So that's why when we flatten it, it doesn't make a difference. Because a linear layer just really, it doesn't care if they're close to each other because it'll just figure it out on its own anyways. It's kind of, if you're confused, that's normal because that would it confuses me. If you actually look at the neurons when they're activated, it's just no, it looks like noise. You won't see a, a four inside that neural net. Like you won't see that representation because it's just the neurons do not care where they are. It's just toggling them to go and uh, reduce whatever um, whatever loss it has with uh, like its incorrect predictions. Yeah. 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 And then it's like, oh, here's a one, and I kind of have a one. Yeah. Model, so I'm just yeah. 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 It. it Yeah, it, it, it's almost, it, it, it's basically magic, which is one reason why one of the challenges with deep learning is, <laughs> one of, no, it's fine. The, the, the biggest problem with, oh, I was going to say, oh, well, magic makes sense also. Um, the problem with deep learning is that um, neural nets are called black boxes for a reason. Um, if your neural net is not working properly or it's massively screwing up, it's extremely hard for you to figure out what's wrong with it. Um, because if you actually look at the weights, it just looks like noise. I should have I should have visualized it, but I haven't I didn't do that here. 
it would just look like random white noise if you, tr if you tried to get the image out directly out of it. Um, but there, there is a something called a, um, so back up here. So instead of linear layer, so maybe you want to care about the shape of the image or whether a pixel is next to another pixel. Like that's more intuitive to you and it's intuitive to me, right? So it's kind of ridiculous that a linear layer really doesn't care about the locations of your items. Um, so there's something called a convolutional a convolutional net. So instead of linear, you, you would do something called a conv2d. And what that is, instead of a flat image, you'll actually feed in a 28 by 28 image and set into it. And it's called a conv2d layer. Um, and that, if you actually like rip it out, it might look something like the number you're looking for. There's no guarantee that it will look like whatever you're looking at, but it might look kind of something like it. Um, like people use uh, uh, convolutional neural nets extensively and like finding faces and stuff like that. Um, and if you open up a convolutional net that's been trained on faces, you might see something about like eyes and nose positions, but once again, it's not gonna look like what you want it to be. It's gonna be very, very weird. Um, and it's really cool to actually see them, like see their activations. Um, but right now, the, I just did linear because this is probably the easiest neural net you could possibly put together. Yeah. It, 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 could it could be seeing something like that, yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah, the whole idea is that you don't really know what it's doing, at least like with linear layers. And one of the things that you can do is, yeah. Yeah. So the actual like neural net on how it like figures out what a number is is done by itself and you're like for something like this you're not gonna be able to figure it out. Like figure out like how it went about doing it. Like debugging it is very, very hard. Um there's a lot of strategies that you can do, but it's gonna be like very weird strategies. Um uh one of the No, it's fine. The um the one of the analogies that you can use for neural nets is that they're self programming programs. And so it's just programming itself. It's, it's those weights that we talked about, it's toggling those weights. And however it toggles it, that's, that's only something that it knows. Um, so we don't really know. Um, but you could use better layers. So you're talking about like, why don't you push in a regular 2D image? Uh, if you wanna do that, I would look into uh, conf2D neural nets. They're not too complicated. The only problem with uh, two-dimensional convolutional layers is that whatever your input is and what you define, they have a very fixed whatever they're gonna output. Um, like this neural net, I could change this to just like 30 and 30, it's not gonna make a difference. Like it's not gonna crash anything. Cause it's just, it, it's just, each neuron is just connected to every other neuron. Um, but a conv net, uh, based on what you input and some of your parameters, it's gonna have some kind of like output. So it's gonna be a little bit more complicated shape-wise. Um, so, so yeah, and in general, like in general, this is what it looks like. Um, so our output layer is gonna output, it's gonna output some kind of like uh, one by 10 neurons. So you have 10 classes, it's gonna output it's gonna, for its 10 classes, it's gonna give a hi, the highest value for the class that it thinks is the image. And so you just get the index of that, um, of that image. Let me see where it is. Oh yeah, I didn't go, go into uh, actually what the training is, but I'm running, I'm running low on time. Um, yeah. So this, this is 
this is just the strategy that you go about training it. I tried to comment as much as I can. You can go to my GitHub for this. Um, an epoch is just a, a full, it went through the entire data set, tested itself, tried to change some of its weights. So I think we do about 200 epochs, so it does it 200 times. It goes through the entire data set, and then it tries to make some changes that makes it do better on that data set. Um, I guess I don't have to do batches. If your data set is really big, you want to do it in pieces. So batches kind of do it that way. Um, yeah, you can talk to me after, after that, but this is up there and you can go and talk to me about if you wanted to um, keep going with this. Um, so yeah, this is a lot of analysis. Uh, I'm using matplotlib for a lot of the visualizing. Um, uh, one of the most important things is you want to feed it, if you're testing how good it is, you want to test it on images that it hasn't seen. So we use, so I split the data set up into test X and test Y. So right now I'm getting 84, 84 accuracy here. And for its training set, I'm getting 100. So most of the time, the images that you trained it on it should do really well accuracy-wise, because these are pictures it's already seen. But the, the accuracy that you really care about are the pictures that it hasn't seen ever. So the ones that you haven't trained on, those are the ones that count. So this accuracy score matters way more than the training accuracy score. Training accuracy score, if that's not close to 100, you have a bug in your model or something. Like, you have something seriously wrong with it. Um, but you, when you're trying to brag to people how good your model is, I mean, it's your test, your, your test score. How good does it do in the real world? Yeah, so there's a lot of strategies they can use. There's things called uh, uh, dropout, which are modules. You can use different layers, different activations, different loss functions. Image augmentation is where you purposely mess with the image, like you move the seven around, flip it upside down. Um, uh, maybe you'll add like some noise to it so it makes it harder to see. Um, and if you do that, it makes it actually do better on images that it hasn't seen before. Yeah, I had, I had another one about like estimating sine waves. It's kind of cool, but um, but like our neural net based on like this input data was able to actually like predict the rest of the sine wave movements. So you don't need to just do image classification. You can do like actual. It can actually become a sine function or a cosine function or some kind of some kind of continuous function if you want it to, but that's a uh, that's for forecasting. Um, also, I didn't fully finish this because it's training really slow. Um, yeah. So, what are all the things that you can do with a neural net? So, we did the image classi classifiers. This is very very recent. So that neural net is obviously way more complicated than ours, um, but this one is predicting a thousand classes. So it's predicting everything from airplanes to cars, and it's just one model. So it's gonna decide whether a picture is of a car or a person or an airplane. Um, so a thousand classes, that's gonna be a very, very big data, data set. Um, object detec detectors, so maybe you wanna classify, but you also wanna know where that object is. It's not as straightforward as you would hope. Um, like you were talking about actually the, um, normally neural nets don't care like the positions of pixels. And so that makes it hard to figure out where that thing is because it'll just look at an image, say, oh, there's a dog in there. But you can't actually figure out like where, what pixels are actually mattering to it. And so these models actually go and try to change that. So it's actually getting a better idea. Um, that involves images with actual, like humans drew bounding boxes on the, where the object is. So these data sets are harder to get, but they, they are popular and out there. So if you wanna know where something is, um, I would look into uh, those kinds of uh, uh, models and data sets. This is very recent, uh, 2019. So uh, there's this, uh, 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 there's this, um, company called uh, OpenAI. They made this neural net model that is able to make uh, fake news articles, fake stories. Uh, it can write poems. Other people have taken it and then trained it to write uh, jokes. 
Um, and this is an example of what it outputs. So the top is like the human. It's the X that we were feeding in. So instead of an image, we're feeding it text. And it's Y was the output. And it's an entire story about some scientists discovering unicorns, I guess. Um, but you can download this right now. So, and this is 2019, this is very recent. So we have neural nets that can now write very convincing context-based stories. And they're, I think they use something called a transformer neural net. They're all using neurons, but there's different ways that you can shuffle the layers to go and make it do very different things. Um, Autoencoders, so like, uh, like a JPEG image compression, something like that, you can use a neural net to also compress data, um, which is actually mind-blowing. Um, and so like, like a human being, like if you show a human being like a picture of a dog, normally a human being, like our brains will go and take that picture of a dog, boil it down into something way simpler. And so this is an example of a neural net boiling something down into something way simpler.